All right, church. Well, I have you take your Bibles this morning. Uh, usually on Sunday mornings, we're in the Gospel of John. Uh, today, uh, it felt like the Lord again kind of gave us a little bit of liberty to go and be in the book of Acts chapter number 2. So today, we're going to be in Acts chapter number 2, and uh, we're going to read verses 22 through uh, 27, or 37, excuse me, Acts chapter number 22 through verse 37. And uh, thankful for our guests for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. And, and so, all right, if you've found your place there, let's all stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word. And then once we're finished reading, we'll pray. Then you can be seated and we'll get into the preaching. Acts chapter number 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Verse 23, him being delivered by the the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now hear and see. And for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord is said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. We'll stop right there. This morning, the title of the message is this, Peter's Good Preaching. Peter's good preaching. So let's have prayer, and then you can be seated. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this day that you've allowed us to have. Lord, we're so thankful for the church family that we're able to assemble here this morning. And Lord, we're thankful for our guests that are joining us as well. Father, I do pray that you would just be with us now. Lord, now is a part of the service where we hear from you. Lord, not from a man, not from me. Lord, I, I do ask you that you would, Holy Spirit, that you would move that you, you would use your word to speak, and Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you. Lord, we love you, and we pray that you'd work in a great and mighty way, Lord, in these next few moments. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, I, I want to thank the Lord I was raised in church. Thank the Lord for that, raised in church. And, and if you were ever raised in church, that's something that you can be thankful for as well. It, it certainly is. And, and if you weren't raised in church, but you're doing your best to raise your kids in church, that's a wonderful thing to do. It really, really is. And of course, of course, I was able to grow up in this church. And then as the years passed on, as I grew in this church, I can't think, help but think of the, the type of preachers that uh, Brother Young would, would bring in. First of all, I'm thankful for my pastor, Brother Young. I'm very thankful for him. And, and even though he does sabotage my office like that, I'm still thankful for him, you know. But, but I, I, I'm thankful for him, thankful for his faithfulness. I'm thankful that when you have missions conferences or revivals, 
that what he would do is that he would bring high caliber preaching to the pulpit. I'm very, very thankful for that. And of course, growing up in church and then uh, going to youth camps and then after youth camps and going to Bible college and then going into the, go, go, moving to New Mexico and serving at a church there and coming here. You know, just over the years, God has allowed, I, I'm, I'm speaking for myself and, and even my wife, that God has allowed us, by the grace of God, to sit under good preaching. I'm very, very thankful for the, the preachers that God has placed in my life and the influences he's placed in my life. But like you, I'm sure, you have in your mind some of your favorite preachers. You probably do. And you probably might, might justify that they might be your favorite preacher by, by, for various reasons. Like you might say in your mind, well, when they preach, they just make the message so good. Like when they preach, they make the message so clear. When they preach, it's like I'm understanding what the Bible is saying. Hey, God wants us to understand what the Bible is saying. And you might have some of your favorite preachers that come to your mind and, and you have them in maybe an order of your mind. Like this, this preacher, he, I like the way that this preacher conveys God's word. I'm thankful for this preacher, how God uses his personality. I'm thankful that God uses a personality like a Dave McCracken. Uh, uh, like there's only one Dave McCracken, so... And uh, I'm thankful that God might use this person, this pastor's or preacher's sense of humor. Now, listen, uh, we can use very many different ways of reasoning and coming to the conclusion of why some preacher might be our favorite preacher. Or, or they, we might say they, the way they convey the message is just so good. But I want us to understand this, okay? I'm not trying to dog on any of those other men who have good personalities and because God uses them in a great way. But I think they would all stand with me and say this, there's nothing in them and there's nothing in me that makes the message good. The message is already good. The message is already good. And Peter, what we're going to see is Peter, he's going to preach a good message, but it's not because it's coming from Peter. It's because the message is already good all by itself. Look at verse 22. Here's Peter. He's starting to preach. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Right off the bat, Peter's telling them exactly not what he's preaching about, who he's preaching about. He's, let, he's letting everybody know. It, listen, this is the day of Pentecost here. And he's letting everybody know what he's, who he's going to be preaching about. Jesus of Nazareth. Now let's keep reading. A man approved of God among you by, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. Peter said that Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. The word approved means to show off. It means to demonstrate. Listen, church, everything Jesus did wasn't to show off braggadociously about who he is. Everything Jesus did, from the miracles that he performed, by the, the people that he fed, by the messages that he taught and preached, thinking about the Sermon on the Mount, or the times where he was even in the synagogue as a 12-year-old boy, everything that he did was to show off, not himself, but to show off his father. Everything that he did was to show off who his father was. And here is Peter, and he says in, in verse number one, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. Now look here, in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. Here's Peter he's saying, you are all aware of the testimony of Jesus. You're all aware of him. This is not news to you. You're aware of his miracles. You're aware of his messages. You're aware of his workings. You're aware of his lessons that he's taught. You know that he's from God. Now look at verse 23. Him being delivered by a, de uh, by a determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, now, now listen. When Peter's preaching here, he's not pulling punches. What he's preaching here He's not flinching. When, when, as Peter's preaching here, he's not desiring to gather a following, nor is he desiring to gather the, the approval of a congregation. That's not what he's doing here. What Peter is doing, he's making it very, very clear here. And he's saying, 
The one who was here, the one who represented the Father, the one who did miracles, the one that you saw just like I saw, the one that he is the Messiah, this is what you did to him. You crucified him. You slain him. Listen, this doesn't sound like a message that Peter is trying to get a lot of amens in. He's not trying to get amens. And he's not trying to gain approval. He's not trying to gain people to say, wow, what a good preacher Peter is. No, no. what Peter's doing, he's just, doing, he's just doing this. He's just giving them the truth about what they did. That's exactly what Peter's doing. This is the primary concern that he had was to give truth. And, and, and he's hitting them exactly where he, he needs to hit them. Look at verse 24. He says, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay, so it's like his opening remarks are, I'm going to preach to you about Jesus of Nazareth. And he tells them he was here amongst us. He was here in the middle of us. And he showed us his works. He showed us his miracle. He showed us all these things. And he was right here in the midst of you. And what you did, children of Israel, is this. You crucified him. You slain him. You, you nailed him to a tree is what he did. And, and he's just giving the truth about who Jesus is and what they did to him. But then he's also saying this. We see Peter, he tells them that as they crucified him. But he also says this, that he resurrected. Verse 24 says, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now that word pains, it, it, it's a word that is often used to describe the, the pains of childbirth. So with, with that notion in mind, childbirth, listen. When, when, when a mama is nine months pregnant and her water breaks, there's no going back. Baby's coming. It's not like you can just put it on pause. The, the, the body is going to force out this little one. It's, just, it's biology. It's, it's just how it works. But, 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 but with that notion in mind, it's like Peter is saying this. Just like uh, the, 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 the female body cannot contain the child that is going through the birthing process. Just like it, the, 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 the womb cannot contain the child, neither could, could the tomb can, could retain the Savior. Listen, Jesus couldn't stay dead. That's awesome. Jesus couldn't stay dead. And, and listen, because Jesus couldn't stay dead, listen, there's a big benefit because of the resurrection. Listen, Peter, what Peter has now done, he's given the opening remarks in his message to let them know who Jesus was, that Jesus was here, that he was sent from God, he was crucified by their hands. But Peter is saying, everything that Peter is saying is completely true. There's no error in what he is saying. But Peter also knows that they're going to need something more than just Peter's word. Hey, hey, listen. When I stand up and I preach to you, you're going to need more than just my word. You're going to need more than just what I have to say. Hey, listen, this is why it's so important that when you come to church, bring your Bible. Bring your Bibles to church. Because listen, I, I, I am sinful man just like you're a sinful man. Or woman. Listen, I, I, I am sinful. Listen, there, there might be, um, by the grace of God, this doesn't go this way. But it's possible that I can err. It's possible that I can go wayward. And, and, and listen, it's possible that I can preach something that's not in the book. Come on church, it's possible. Let, let, let's not think that Calvary Baptist Church is above that. Let's not think that Calvary Baptist Church will never, ever go air. Never, ever go wayward. No, no, no. We're sinners. We assemble together. We are very, very capable of going wayward. We certainly are. So this is why it's so important that when preaching is going on, you have your Bibles in front of you, and you see not what man says, but what God says. And so here's Peter, and he knows that everything he just told them is true, but he, they need more. Well, what does Peter give them? Peter gives them exactly what we have. He gives them the word of God. Verse 25, look there, it says, For David speaketh concerning him. You know what he's doing? He's Peter, he's referencing Psalms chapter number 16 to try to explain David's prophecy about the Christ. Okay? Verse 27 says, 
Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, if we're not careful, there, some people might think that Psalms chapter number 16 is David writing about himself. But it's, David is not writing about himself because David is not the holy one. He's not. Verse 27 says, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, what does that word corruption mean? It means to suffer decay as a result of death. Basically, a decomposing process. And so what Peter does in verse 29, he says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. And so what Peter does to the people of Israel, he's saying this. Psalms chapter number 16 is not David writing about himself. Psalms chapter number 16 is David writing about the Christ who will not see corruption. Who his body will not decompose. And then, well, how do they know that? Because Peter says this, David's bones are still here. David is still dead. David is a corpse. So therefore, it's not referring to David, Psalms chapter 16. David could not have written this about himself. All right, now look at verse 30 and 31. We're moving right along here. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither, did, neither his flesh did see corruption. So here's Peter. This is what he's saying, that, that David in Psalm 16 is not referring to himself. He's referring to the Christ. He's saying Christ is the Holy One. The Christ is the one who's going to sit on the throne. Christ is the one who's going to reign. Christ is the Holy One whose body is not going to see corruption. And what Peter does next is by way of application, we see Peter, he reaffirms that Jesus is that Christ. 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Did you hear that? He says, Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus had resurrected. This Jesus doesn't see corruption. This Jesus is the Holy One. And then he says this, whereof we are all witnesses. Hey, you know, it's, it's a very good thing that there was over 500 witnesses who saw the resurrected Jesus. 500 witnesses. Hey, 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 listen, I, I, I'm not trying to, to bash or I'm not trying to be critical of different uh, of other religions or anything like that. No, no, listen, but, but I want to say this. There's no other deity that resurrected from the dead where there was witnesses. Think of that. There was no witness. First of all, Muhammad never resurrected and there's no witnesses. Buddha never resurrected and there's no witnesses. Yeah, people still are willing to believe and put all their faith into and, and those types of religions. But here's the thing. We, 500 witnesses saw the resurrected Jesus. And here is Peter. And he's saying this. I saw him. Not only I saw him, but 499 other people saw him. They, they saw the resurrected Christ. And, but be, and also, but because of the resurrection, listen, there's a huge benefit to the fact that Jesus resurrected from the dead. There's a huge benefit because of that. Well, what's the benefit? Well, look at verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Listen, we've been talking about in the, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said that it would, it would be better that he would leave the disciples. Why would it be better? Because when he leaves, when he ascends to the right hand of the Father, he's sending a comforter. He's sending the Holy Ghost. Listen, we benefit greatly by having the Holy Ghost with us. You benefit greatly by having the Holy Ghost with you if you're saved. 
If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling with inside of you. Listen, that's a huge benefit. And so here is Peter, and he's telling them in verse 33, he says, which ye now see and hear. See and hear, what does that mean? Well, listen, Pastor Richard, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, there was no outward evidence of the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of me. Hey, listen, when I accepted Christ as a little boy at the foot of my parents' bed, the gates of heaven did not open and a big light shine down round about me, and a halo go over my head. Did it happen for you? If it did, I did something wrong. Okay? No, no, listen, there, there's no outward appearance of salvation the moment you accept Christ as your Savior. So what is he talking about? The things that you now see and hear. Okay, well, just kind of put a little bit of context to Acts chapter number 2. We need to remind ourselves, this is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. And it was at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God came down like a rushing mighty wind. Remember that? Came down like a rushing mighty wind. And then here's the, here's the thing. The disciples, they were able to speak in tongues. You, you're talking about speaking in tongues, Pastor Richard. Listen, tongues is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, tongues is a biblical thing. When done right. What, 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 what's the context of this? Listen, when the Holy Spirit of God came upon Peter and the disciples, when they came upon them, they weren't speaking gibberish. They weren't speaking a language that nobody understood. They weren't speaking some heavenly language. Hey, hey, listen, church family, if you ever go on vacation and you ever go to try to find a church somewhere and you're going to a church and they put a real emphasis on tongues and all of a sudden they start speaking something that you have no idea what they're saying, you need to find a different church. I'm just telling you. Because what, what happened in here in Acts chapter number 2, it wasn't some heavenly language. No, the Bible tells us this, that they were speaking languages that people understood. They were speaking languages that people could comprehend and understand. And, and they, they, it was an actual language, not just some gibberish. That's what it was. And so here is Peter, and he's saying the things that we see and the things that we hear, it's, it's evident the Holy Spirit of God came upon them. It's, it, it's a benefit that Jesus resurrected and ascended into, the, into heaven because now we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Now listen, when the disciples died, those gifts died. Would you follow me? When the disciples died, those gifts died. Well, why did those gifts die? Because listen, those gifts were just simply there to confirm the message that they were preaching was truth. It wasn't just so that, hey, look how spiritual elite we are. We're able to speak in some different languages. No, it was confirmation that the gospel message that they were preaching about Jesus was indeed truth and that they need to believe in Jesus. That's what the whole purpose of it was. But when the disciples, when those apostles died, listen, those gifts died with them. Well, why did it die with them? Because this, because now we have the completion of God's word. That is why. For church, we need to be careful when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to, to gifts and, and, and tongues and things of that sort. We need to be careful and be cautious of that. So the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost wasn't necessarily a what type of message. It was a who type of message. And what Peter preached, who he preached, was Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, wouldn't you say Peter came a long way? From being the guy who denied Jesus to common folk. He came a long way in that short period of time. From the man who, to the point of even cursing and denying Christ. Now here he is. He's filled with the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. And this is what he's doing. He's proclaiming the Lord Jesus. Now listen, as he preached Jesus, he preached with he preached Jesus with a motive in mind. What was the motive? To confirm that Jesus is Lord and the Christ who they crucified. Look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Here's the thing. Peter made his case. Peter, here's the message. Peter made his case through the word of God. 
Peter made his case through the Spirit of God. He made the case that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the one who resurrected, that he is the Holy One. But Peter also reminds him of what they did to the Holy One. He reminds him of what they did to the Christ, what they did to the Savior. And he's saying this, you crucified him. You killed him. You, you, you rejected the Messiah. You forsook the Christ. Now look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. What's that mean? They were convicted. When they heard this, they were convicted. Church, there's something that we, we need to take away from what we just read here. And we can't afford to miss it. When Peter preached, understand, he was filled with the Spirit of God. When he preached, he used the Word of God. And when he proclaimed the Son of God, this is what happened. This is what resonated in their hearts. Conviction. That's what resonated in their hearts. And let me say this to you here this morning. That is good preaching. That's good preaching right there. L listen, you and I, we need good preaching. That's, the, that's what we need. I need good preaching. You need good preaching. Listen, we, 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 we want to be careful here. We just don't need loud preaching. Just because a preacher might be loud doesn't mean it's good. We, we don't need loud preaching. We don't need animated preaching. Right? We, we, we don't need funny preaching. Listen, don't get me wrong. Once again, I'm thankful that God uses pastors who have a sense of humor. I, I, I think we as Christians should laugh in church when it's time to laugh. I, 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 I'm thankful for, 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 pe for preachers and, and, and pastors that, that come and they, they preach and, and God uses their personalities in a great way. But, but listen, their personalities doesn't make the message great. The message was already great. And what you and I need is that we need preaching that will do this. Well, what qualifies good preaching? Preach, what qualifies good preaching is this. Preaching that convicts the heart. That is good preaching not coddle the feelings, but convicts the hearts. That's the type of preaching that you need. That's the type of preaching that I need. Listen, the type of preaching that you and I need is preaching that is filled by the Spirit of God. Hey, hey listen, church. I covet your prayers. I do. Listen, I understand my role here. I understand my role is the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. I understand that. And one of the major roles that's given to us through the word of God is this. One of my major roles is this. Feed the flock. Feed the flock. Hey, 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 church, I want to encourage you. There's a little bit of selfishness here. But I want to encourage you, pray for me. Because this is the thing. Uh, on, when on comes... Tuesday mornings and, 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 and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. Th this is the, the role that I have to do. I have to prepare. I have to labor. I have to, l listen, preparing sermons is not just something that you can just kind of throw together in 30 minutes. Uh, listen, it, it, a good uh, 30, 40 minute message. We're looking, talking about eight hours of preparation here. I, I listen, there's a lot of wrestling with the text. There's a lot of... Uh, 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 <laughs> makes it sound like I'm complaining. I'm not complaining. There's a lot of, uh, of stress. There's a lot of agonizing over the passage, wrestling with the passage, trying to get proper context, trying to find the, the proper way of application. And, and, and listen, church family, come Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night when there's going to be preaching of God's word, you, I, I hope and pray that you pray for me that the spirit of God would show up when we preach. Because listen, you shouldn't... Oh, uh, when Brother Joel came up here to, and, uh, to what we did, we rehearsed. And Brother Joel did a good job. He did a good job. But, but something I wanted to emphasize to Brother Joel when we're up here. Hey, hey listen, th this is not a stage to perform. This is a platform. Th 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 listen, this is not a, a comedy routine here. No, 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 listen. When business is being taken place up here, there needs to be a reverence for this. 
When business is being taken, taken care of up here, there needs to be some reverence. And there needs to be some respect. There needs to be some God-fearing behind it, for sure. But, but listen, when, when preaching is taking place here, you need to pray that the Holy Spirit of God show up. Be filled. Good preaching is filled by the Spirit of God. But also listen to this. Good preaching just isn't just filled with the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God won't preach apart from the Word of God. Hey, listen, if you ever go to a church and they say, don't worry about bringing your Bibles, go to a different church. I'm not trying to be offensive here, but you don't need to hear from me. You need to hear from God. You don't need to hear from man. You need to hear from the Holy Spirit of God through the word of God. That's what you need. That's what we all need. Because, listen, once you hear from the spirit of God through the word of God, then this is what it will do in some way, shape or form. It should do this. Prick the heart. That's what it should do. Hey, listen, all scripture is profitable. You know what Peter did? Look, look here, look here. This is what Peter did. Peter used the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Hey, if we're not careful, we as a New Testament church, we might say this. It's just so much easier to just read the New Testament. How many of you have ever had that thought before? Heathens. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I understand it. I understand that logic. It, sometimes reading the New Testament is uh, easier to understand. I, I get that. I understand that because I read my Bible. It is easier to understand in some portions, no doubt. But here's the thing. What the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in the New Testament of 2 Timothy, he wrote this in the New Testament, that all Scripture... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What does that mean? From Genesis to Revelation, we need all of it, church. We need all of it. Even Leviticus. Even First Chronicles. The genealogies and so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and so-and-so begat, so-and-so. It's all profitable. And it all is. Hey, hey, listen, let's, let's not be a church that says we're only going to focus on the New Testament. No, 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 no. If we're, if we're going to focus on the book, then we need to focus on the whole book. For sure. You know, the point I'm trying to make is that preaching that convicts is preaching that comes from the Word of God by the Spirit of God. But lastly, good preaching is not focused on what? Good preaching is focused on who? Listen, praise God for Calvary Baptist Church for 69 years, going on 70 years, I believe in March, 70 years, Calvary Baptist Church is going to be 70 years old in March. But I praise God that for pastors before me, faithful men before me, what they've done is they weren't, they weren't concerned about preaching a what type of message. They were more so concerned about preaching a who type of message. And listen, church, we cannot afford to stray away to preaching what is good and what is popular and what is acceptable. No, we should always stay close and preaching this, who we serve. We should always stay close in preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, period. It's not a what message, it's a who message. Now listen, don't get me wrong. I know that there's going to be, there's going to come times and, and, and throughout preaching series and different series like that, that there's going to be topics that we're going to cover, no doubt, especially in Sunday school. Uh, I know we did the avoiding confusion. There was a lot of topics that we talked about, and that would be considered more of a what type of message. But, but listen, there's going to be topics. There's going to be a series that cover certain things that uh, we are facing in this world. But ultimately, the reason for those is so that we get closer to the who. Not get away from the who, but to get closer to the who. To get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, hey, listen, Calvary Baptist Church, what we need to do, what we should always focus on doing, is that Calvary Baptist Church should be a church where there is good preaching taking place. Not necessarily funny preaching. I'm not against laughter. Not necessarily against animated preaching. I'm not against a Dave McCracken hopping over pews. That is quite entertaining. I'm not going to lie, okay. 
But listen, ultimately, if we're going to be a church that has good preaching, then the preaching must do this, must come from the Spirit of God, from the Word of God, pushing us to the Son of God. That is good preaching. And that's what you need. And that's what I need. The Bible tells us here that when they heard this, it pricked their hearts. I'll, let me just tell you up front. Preaching serves an agenda. There's an agenda behind preaching. When I stand up in front of you, or Brother Young, or Brother Brian, or whomever, the Lord allows you to hear preach. When I stand before you, I'll tell you up front, there is an agenda. Well, what's the agenda? The agenda is this. You respond to how God spoke. That's the agenda. You know what's unfortunate? That there's good preaching. Not necessarily funny. Not necessarily animated. Not necessarily running around and you're dying in your, and you're dying in your pew laughing or you're weeping and you're crying. No, no, no. But there's good preaching that's filled with the Holy Spirit of God from the Word of God trying to push you to the Son of God. But here's the thing, what we do. Sometimes we hear good preaching and we don't allow it to convict the heart. We sit back and we say, well, that was good, but I've already heard that before. Well, that was good, but I like the other guy better. Well, that was fine, and I did my Christian duty for the week, and all is well. No, listen, when the word of God is open, church, we need to have the attitude of this, that the spirit of God would prick your heart. Touch your heart. Through the spirit of God, through the word of God, making you more like the son of God, making you more like Jesus. So church, you need good preaching. And I need good preaching. So pray for your preacher, if you don't mind. As there's hours of preparation, pray that the Spirit of God would be made known. That you open up the Word and say, this is exactly what it's saying. This is exactly what the Word says. There's no confusion here. This is exactly what God is saying. You need good preaching, and I need good preaching. What's good preaching? Filled with the Spirit of God, from the Word of God, pushing us to the Son of God. That's what it is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord.